So let's do from C to C++ to Rust, apparently back from Haskell. I see Haskell in there. I don't know what's happening here. Welcome to a code report solution video. In this video, I'm going to be refactoring some C code to C++ to Rust, and then also looking at the equivalent Haskell. Can't you just like take C and call it CPP and boom, you got yourself CPP? Again, get that out of my mouth. Haskell code to see how functional languages influenced Rust. And if you stay tuned to the end, I'm also gonna do a short comparison of the number of assembly instructions generated by each of the C, C++, and Rust solutions, which is quite interesting. I've never watched this video. I'm very excited. Uh, did you just say you wanna see my PP? This is gonna be on YouTube, Bisco, and you know I read everything you say, okay? I'm like Ron Burgundy and I can't even help it. Now that's gonna be on YouTube, Bisco. In my opinion. But the first question is, why am I making this video? A few days ago, or maybe now, it was a couple weeks ago, YouTube recommended me on my homepage Whoa. this YouTube video from- Whoa, can we go back? What in the world was going on here? What is, what is happening right there? <laughs> she, that is, so, that is something. It was a couple weeks ago. YouTube recommended me on my homepage this YouTube video from a YouTube channel. Okay, I, I love Code Aesthetic. So, hey, Code Report, I don't know if you know we know each other, but I love Code Aesthetic. Okay, I don't think he loves me. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I don't even know, but I, I love, I love Code Aesthetic, okay? Code Aesthetic. And the title of the video was Why You Shouldn't Nest Your Code, and the thumbnail says, I'm a never nester. So I was intrigued. Classic. I love programming YouTube videos. I clicked on it, and then I was very quickly disappointed <laughs> not to say that the video is <laughs> poor code aesthetics <laughs> am i right <laughs> it's not funny okay we're about love on this youtube channel okay or we love all these people average code aesthetics experience code drama it's terrible but I was hoping that the video would go in a different direction because it starts by showing you some C code. Hey, can we be real here for a second? Look, dude, this guy, I don't know what he does. This thumbnail, it's not like it's it's crazy engaging. Some, dude, look at that, it's crazy. And then says this code is too heavily nested and then refactors it by basically pulling a small piece of the function and just putting it in another function so that it reduces the total amount of nesting. Okay, sure, maybe that's the refactoring you want to do. It's just not the refactoring I wanted to see. So in this video, I'm going to show you what I was hoping to see in the video, and hopefully it is educational. Hoping to see, and we're starting off in C, huh? You don't think I didn't get that code report? Okay, I like where you're going with these puns, code report. Funny guy right here. I, you could just tell right away this guy's going to be laying down some pretty slick jokes. ...for the viewers. So let us go to the C code that was initially shown in the Never Nester video. Check out the link in the description down below if you want to go and watch that. <coughs> Sorry. Every time I see a, a squirrely brace on a new line, I have to swallow the bile that comes up. Okay, we can, we can continue. That video first. We're given a function called calculate that takes two parameters that are integers called bottom and top that form an inclusive range due to the fact that we have a less than or equal in our for loop. And we basically have an if statement that's gonna form two branches. When top is greater than bottom, we're gonna enter the first branch. It's gonna declare a local integer sum. We're then gonna have an index based for loop that goes through all the numbers between bottom and top inclusive. And anytime we encounter an even number, which we determine using our modulus two right is equal to zero, we do a plus equals to our local sum and then return that sum at the end of the for loop. Otherwise we return zero. I mean, I, my guess is I haven't seen this one from Code Aesthetic either, but my assumption is that he pulls out this right here and puts this into a new function so that way it feels a little bit less. Maybe he puts some squirrely braces on, on the same line so that way it's not as nearly as bad. Am I right on that? Maybe that's what's happening. Yeah, never nesters, more like never have good code style. Take that, Code Aesthetics. Okay, remember, I like Code Aesthetics. And this is the code we start with. Hopefully pretty easy to understand. 
And we are now for the rest of the video going to refactor this first. Yeah, early C++ return plus, first. And then show the Absolutely. equivalent rest code and then some Haskell at the end. So the first thing we're going to do is change this to C++, which requires doing absolutely nothing. I compile. <laughs> Checkmate atheist. Okay. All those people coming in thinking that we had to do something when changing it to C++. Yeah, right. No, no, no. You just need a color scheme change and boom, you're in. You're in. CPP called it right there. Piled this with GCC 12.2 for both the C and C++ code, and it works perfectly fine. And for a couple unit tests, gives the same answer. So nothing to do here. We'll look at the assembly generated by both or the number of instructions later. But the next change we're going to make is just reformatting this because there's too much white space in this for my liking. <laughs> He just got, he got squirrely brace, same line, dunked on right there. Look, well, squirrely brace, dunked on. Too much white space, you know. Um, you know, like maybe we could have like less white space somehow if we just really think about it. Everyone's got different preferences, but for the purposes of this video, we're going to make this a little bit more dunked. dense, which I prefer. This obviously is yeah, not a semantic like change. So our first semantic change is going to be using something from C++20 called views iota. So here we are basically replacing our index based for loop with a range based for loop, which is now basically looping through. You know, I feel like every time I look at C++, it's like they, they have just the longest way to say the shortest thing. You know what I mean? You know, that, that previous for loop was just, there was just so much less to it. This obviously is not a semantic change. So our first semantic change is going to be using something from C++20 called views iota. So here we are basically replacing our index. And it's inclusive? Oh yeah, no, it's not inclusive. It's exclusive. This loop is inclusive. Uh, you know, I I really don't like that. I'm not a fan of the iota ligma operator. You know, based for loop with a range based for loop, which is now basically looping through each number in the views iota range that is determined by basically the views iota adapter here. So it's determined by passing two parameters or one, but in this case we want two, a uh, bottom and top plus one because it is not inclusive. It doesn't include the last number that you want to. So this is basically equivalent code. And in my opinion, a lot nicer because it avoids, you know, abilities for uh, off by one errors because you don't have to do, you know, plus or minus increments and a less than comparison, you just create a range. And I honestly don't get the term iota. Okay, I know he's saying all these things and I'm sure whatever he's saying is really, really smart and adept, but I'm like super stuck on the fact that it's iota. Iota is the smallest character in Greek, right? And I know in I don't, I don't know. I know it's using Go, but Go goes crazy. Iota. Rever yeah, Iota integer to ASCII range. I'm super confused. I, I'm super confused right now. Uh, but my, I'm more stuck on C++. And what the hell's a views? And then you can use a range-based for loop. Much nicer. The next semantic change that we can do now is to add a views filter along with our views iota to basically replace the if statement that we have checking for even. So we can filter out the <laughs> odd numbers by basically going. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. There's there's nothing semantically worse than a C++ uh, function like this. Oh my goodness. The empty capture group and auto. I hate auto in C++. It's not because auto is somehow like you get this nice inferred ability. Every LSP in the universe just returns. I don't know. That's what it returns. It is just the worst to work with auto. I hate working with auto. But I would like to say I use auto like wild. Okay. Hey, just re real talk. I use a lot of auto. Okay. Because I'm, I'm evil. I'm a mean individual. 
Oh my goodness, I really am not a fan of this. And I didn't know this bar operator. What is this bar operator? It looks like a bitwise or operation on... On an iterator? Oh, they overload it. Oh, yeah, I forget. C++, you can just overload operators. Uh, duh, I'm stupid. It, they overload. Oh, yeah, yeah, they overload a bit. A, a bit or, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm stupid. I'm stupid, man. I'm stupid, man. Going filter even, where even is a lambda that's um, above our range base for loop now that checks the modulus to equal to zero to determine if our numbers are even. So this is quite nice in my opinion. Once again, comes from C++20, so you have to be using the C++20 version in order for this to work. And then the next thing we can do is basically replace our for loop and our local integer sum with a, collect, a call right? to the C++ 98, I believe, uh, numeric algorithm std accumulate. So we can basically get rid of Did our- Did he just say std? I've never called it std. std accumulate. std accumulate. These studs are accumulating hard in my front yard. Yeah, I've never heard that. Okay, that's fine. I, hey, I'm not a big C++ guy. I'm not a big C++ guy. Yeah, I know. I, I could handle things, TJ. But now that he's throwing out stud like that, I don't think I can do it. Um, I mean, this is this does feel better, I guess, in my in base opinion. It's based. Okay, everybody. Feel good. Uh... I would say that in general, I'm okay with this. I'm used to the fact that iterators, you have to do this like dot begin dot end bull crap. Um, it is what it is. Local sum. And now we have. Let's go boys. Big dick energy. You guys got some Dr. Pepper. I love the Asmund gold AI machine, by the way. All right, let's keep on going. Have uh, an even local variable, which is our Lambda and then evens, which is a composition of our IOTA and our filter from the C++ 20 views. And then we can pass this to our std accumulate numeric algorithm <laughs> as sort of again. the begin and end of our range of evens and initialize this to be zero and just return this directly. So already here, you can see by using more modern features, some of them are not that modern because std accumulate existed in C++ 98. We have re reduced the amount of our nesting drastically, but we can continue to go further. So the next thing we're gonna use is actually not in standard C++ yet, but we will be getting something like this. I call it in, standard. I believe C++ 23, which is the uh, standard that is being uh, you know, adopted or implemented right now. So depending on when you're watching this in the future, you might actually be able to use this without calling on a library. Here we need to use a library though, which is the range V3, which gives us access to a ranges accumulate. So this is not the standard accumulate. And this gives us the ability to pass the range directly as our first argument to our accumulate algorithm. So we still have the zero at the end of our accumulate algorithm as the initial value. You know, people do say rust is ugly. Okay. They say that. You know, I, I actually don't think this is that all that bad. I mean, C++ is an ugly-ass language. Like, if you go in, into writing C++, like, you're going to have some nice experience. It's just straight-up ass, okay? It's always been ass. It's always going to be ass. You know, the the... the the meme with the gun and the astronauts. This is ass. This is pessimistic code. Yeah, this is the pessimistic code that Casey was talking about. I've been working in C++ for a long time. And a short time all at the same time. And just because I've worked over a long amount of years, but only in short little spurts. And every time I do it, I hate it. But I never get to use any of these modern features. Okay, I never get any of these really nice features. I'm just writing good old fashioned const reference accumulator nonsense for for goodnesses, okay? But we don't need to declare a local called evens and then call the dot begin and dot end. We can just pass the view directly, which is even nicer in my opinion. And there is one next thing we can do, but before we're gonna do that, we basically are gonna get rid of the std views namespace because at this point, it's gonna make the code a little bit messy. So if we just declare namespace RV equals std views, we can replace the two std views with RV. And at this point, we can now make our change, uh, which is gonna irritate some people. Why is it RV? How did we get RV out of this? How 
how did we get RV out of this? Okay. I don't, I, I, I swear the animations are really nice. Rec <laughs> recreational vehicle coding. Yeah. I don't know how we got RV on this one. There must be a reason for the R. Range views. Hmm. But these are standard views. Because there is ranges. <laughs> these are standard views. These are SVs, okay? Because I know there are some people that hate the ternary operator, but we can get rid of our if else branch because we're basically doing two things that do returns. Real and views. Return no, this into don't do a that. Single statement. Stop that. That no. is the. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Just people, honestly, it's always worth it. Just take this stupid line of code, put the effing if statement right here, return early, and then just return this. You know why? Because there's that moment you want to log. And the moment you want to log, it always ends up you have to rewrite this anyways, and it's just the worst experience in the universe. Just do the thing. You know what I mean? Just do it. Just just make the if statement. It's not worth it. It's never worth it. Ternary operator and... To be fair, I do like ternary operators if it's like this or that, and it's something small. But it's just, it always feels like every time I use it, I always end up regretting it, right? I know I say it, but man, I always end up regretting it. Surely the IOTA thing should handle the top being lower than the bottom. Surely it should. Don't call me Shirley though. Basically has two different branches now. So we check his top less than or equal to bottom. And this, we're just inverting the comparison to be able to put the zero first. And then otherwise we do our call to ranges accumulate. That is a composition of IOTA and filter. For some yeah, of you- Yeah, debugging this is really hard. Uh, it's one of these problems about, I mean, anytime you have these type of mappy type operations, debugging is difficult. The goal of these things is that it reduces the amount of change so that you shouldn't worry about this, right? Like that's the whole thing is that it comes in here and you know that, okay, I'm only filtering on these. But every now and then your filter gets us just a little too complex and boom, it sucks to debug. You know what I mean? I, I'm not fully on... Uh, I'm not fully on the functional train just because debugging is kind of a pain in the ass sometimes. That have never seen any of this, it might seem overwhelming, but once you get used to this stuff, in my opinion, it's actually much, much more readable than the code we started with, and it's more declarative. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mind this code. I, I do think it's nicer. I think the previous one was like overwhel Like if I knew what ranges accumulate meant and RV iota and RV filter meant, right? Like if this was a normal thing for me to see, this would be really, really easy to understand, right? No, remember, re readability is a function of experience. This is very experience. He's had this experience many times, so this is very simple for him. Uh, you know, when I'm in Rust and I see the exact same thing in Rust, it feels very easy. Okay, so I mean, I, I feel like it's one of those things where it's it's totally easy if you're used to doing it a certain way. I know they're all saying it's not readable. This is this functional. I assume this is a be single readable statement. If I did a bunch of and stuff. sure, it makes use of a ternary expression. I'm a big fan of the ternary expression because it leads to more declarative code. No, it and, doesn't. Um, it's not ideal. It just I, makes it so frustrating. Just give me imper imperative is always almost the right answer. I've seen very few times imperative not being the right answer. Ideally, I'd be able to pipe the ranges accumulate um, after the iota and filter, but unfortunately, we don't have that in C. However, It'd be nice if Rust, you had a pipe into a... We can do the exact yeah. same thing we're doing here, except yeah. just slightly nicer. Got a sum. Yeah. Except it's actually way nicer. And it's the following. So yep. note, we no longer have need this for is my, a ternary this is the expression code that I made because in my head. it handles the case where um, bottom is going to be less than or equal to top. <laughs> C++ doesn't handle that case. <laughs> Does C++ just go on forever? Does C++... Does C++ just go on? <laughs> it's like, well, I'm adding one and it still hasn't happened yet. I don't know what's happening here. I know you said that, TJ. I just had to believe. I know it wraps eventually. You know, you're eventually going to get that four billion times through. Oh, my goodness. It's a wapper. Using the dot dot equals operator that forms a range. This is really nice, and by the way. We don't this have the pipe nice. operator here, but we have filter and we have a built-in sum, which is the equivalent of our accumulate. Our lambda is much, much more uh, readable and concise, in my opinion. And this is the epitome of beautiful code. 
Uh, I would say missing the return, explicit return, loser. Uh, no, I'm kidding. That's just me, right? Uh, but seriously, again, for people that are new to Rust, this looks really unreadable. But for someone who's been doing Rust for a little bit, this is really straightforward, right? Like this is exactly what I expected to see in my head, and this is exactly what I see. I would reformat this a little bit differently for slideware, but you know, this is basically the exact same. It's code. very readable. Make the font yeah. a tiny bit bigger, and it's slightly more readable. But Rust format would keep this all in one line. However, when you do start to chain these oper operations, I would say like this is one of my favorite features of Rust right here is the fact that they have a built-in range, and the range becomes something that you can interact with. Uh, it, it turns into an iterator, or it is an iterator in of itself. Like, I really love that there's syntax dedicated to making a range. Right? This, I think this is just a very important concept in programming, and it, it avoids a whole catastrophe of off-by-one errors. And, you know, in reality, I have off by one errors all the time, right? It's just totally normal. For those that don't understand, that means from bottom up to top and including it. That's the equal sign. Then it's going to filter E. It's weird. I would have used X. I'm always an X kind of guy, not an E kind of guy. E doesn't make any sense to me. E is just every single letter that or every single number that comes out of here, right? So if bottom was zero, top was five, this filter would get called with zero, one, two, three, four, five. E, of course, modulo two equals zero bam, 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 returns true for every even element, then you sum it. Pretty straightforward, right? E is for even. Well, that doesn't make any sense because it's not even until they do the check. E is for exception, or even, or error, or W. <laughs> element. Oh, it's an element. Y'all don't make any sense, okay? But it's making evens. Oh, it's for event. It's for erection, actually. It's for full-on Rust-based erection together and go past a certain length this is how rust format would format it and this is just absolutely gorgeous in my opinion um the i32s are Thanks, more Flip. informative than the ints which are implicitly on most platforms in 32 underscore t just super beautiful lambdas you know these are the iterator this is sort of using the iterator trait which is the spiritual equivalent of ranges in c plus plus 20 and c plus plus 23 uh rust is phenomenal here for I do like the spiritual equivalent. Good call. You know, pieces of code like Sorry, this. Sorry, I can't interact. And flip. like I mentioned before, Stop, we don't need right to now. make use of the ternary operator because the range created by the double dot equal operator is okay. Going TJ to got take banned. Okay, TJ got banned. TJ got banned. Okay, TJ got banned. TJ. Oh, flip. Can you keep uh, the shilling to a minimum? TJ asking for shilling to a minimum. Here's the deal. Here's the deal, Karen. This is what I was thinking personally, is that if you can place his laptop on several T's, individual T's, I will go get my driver, go home right now, lunch hour it, and we could see how far this thing can fly. That's what I'm thinking personally. That's a good way to fire somebody. Uh, else, we could just lock him out of his email and let him discover that tomorrow. Which one do you think is better? Uh, I'm personally more the aggressive kind, personally. All right, I'm very excited about this. ...of that case where um, bottom is sort of less than top and it's just gonna automatically return you zero. Absolutely beautiful. And at this point, some of the most astute observers and I'm viewers astute. of this video I'm will not. be thinking in your head, the Rust code is actually not equivalent to the C and C++ versions of the code. Really? And that's because, not because I think I made a mistake or the Rust code is wrong, but because I think there was a bug in the initial C code that got carried over to each of these C++ solutions. And I wonder if anyone has seen that bug. If so, hit the comment section down below and said, I saw it first. But basically that bug, I think is the following. If you take a look at this for loop, the range that is defined by this for loop is an inclusive range. It starts at bottom, increments up to top, and includes top. It's a less than equal to top. However, the if statement um, does not cover that case where not bottom is equal to top. That's behavior. So if we have top and bottom both equal to six, it'll return zero. However, based on this for loop, 
you should actually return the value of an even number if both top and bottom are equal to that even number. And the Rust code will return you six. Which uh, you know, that's kind of hard because you got to follow like the logic that's already there. So unless if that is explicitly the bug, because you know, the, the function's called calculate. We don't know what calculate does. We don't know what it's supposed to do. And so I would actually argue that this is incorrect then. And that should just be an edge case. That's part of the edge case, right? That's part of it. That's what you get. That's the kind of life you have to live. That's that, right? Big if true. Yeah, it's a big if. It's true. You know what I mean? Which is why I think it's not actually a bug importing it from C and C++ to Rust. It's a bug that is not actually, it's, it's a bug that's materialized if you have the proper unit tests. And I guess if you had the unit tests in C and C++ in the first case, you would notice the bug and you'd fix it. But the point here is that if you were thinking in your head there was a mistake porting this to Rust, I actually think that materializes the bug in the C and C++ code, not in the Rust code itself. So food for thought, maybe that is what the intent, uh, initial intent of that function was. We'll never know. But that's my guess. I also dislike that if he were to do the initial code, he'd have to put an if statement here. And then since he's using implicit returns, he'd have to do an else statement as well to else zero. I, I, I've always, I don't like the else explosion that happens with implicit returns. I hate that. I hate else's. Else's, I don't like that. I don't know why I don't like it. It's so unreasonable of me. I just hate it. I don't know what it is. I don't know why I get so worked up over the smallest things, right? Like I can walk into a project and there can be five levels of inheritance. And I'm like, yeah, that's stupid. Uh, but then... There's like an if else, and I'm just like, mother you come in here with that big if else energy, right? Like, I, I will lose my shit over the stupidest thing in the universe. I don't know why. I don't know why. It just, it. I don't know. It's just so stupid. I, you know, literally, yeah, I know. It's it's dumb. It feels dumb. It, n n <sighs> Maybe we can contact the author of Code Aesthetic and ask ask them. All right. I promised that I we would look Mr. at the equivalent Haskell code, which is actually quite similar to the Rust code. And that's because Rust was heavily inspired by the ML language family. And, you know, some people say it's more influenced by OCaml. Some people Does say ML it. stand for modern language. What does ML stand for? Okay. I'm going to ask a stupid question. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm being vulnerable. Okay. I'm being vulnerable right now. Machine language. <laughs> means chat. It actually just means chat. I'm going to go with machine language on this one. I will not be listening to the meta language callouts here. It's more influenced okay. by Haskell. Meta's a company. So I don't know meta language. There's many meta languages. Okay, so I don't know what you're... Okay. It stands for meta ligma. Okay. Mommy love. Well, potato, 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 you know, they're both mommy very love. similar languages when comparing it to C++ and C. And this is the Haskell code. So you'll note we are also defining... I can totally understand why Haskell is completely useless. You know, just an immediate look at this, I can just completely understand why Haskell is useless, right? You can just see it right away. Um, a range using the dot dot no. operator, very inspired. And then we are filtering even. We have a built-in even predicate, so we don't even need to spell it out in Haskell. And then we just sum after that. And if is, is dot dot inclusive? I don't want to look at APL. So dot dot is inclusive. That seems like a big, big, big miss. Okay, so how do you read this? Okay, so just to be specific, let me, let me try to understand how to read this. I'm just going to guess. Calculate takes in a bottom and a top, and we are going to sum the result from a filter of even over the range of bottom up to and including top. Oh, no, you go right to left. Okay, so we take the range of bottom to top, only have the even items out of it because it's a filter even so this dollar sign must be some something i don't know what this dollar sign is and then those values are summed oh to exclude you have to put a bang dollars are pipes 
It's basically, let's see, dollar and uh, basically adds parents from there to the end of the line. <laughs> that somehow made no sense to me. Oh, wait a second. It adds an opening and a closing is what you're trying to say. Oh! Okay. I really don't understand this little top definition up here. I don't know what's the, what in the world's going on up there. Okay. And is it, so dollar makes parentheses. Is that jQuery? Is this jQuery inspired language? If we compare these two, you can see how similar they are and that they are very much, you know, spiritual equivalents, even though Rust and Haskell are I very... don't see it at all. I don't see how this is equivalent at all. I feel like... I'd have to like relearn programming to do Haskell. Whereas I feel like this one, I didn't have to relearn anything. Yeah, this is definitely like second cousin business, third cousin business right here. Um, I feel like I have to, I have to reorient my mind to understand Haskell. Yeah, I'm climaxing hard on realization right now. Whereas with this, I'd say if you have any understanding of basic C languages, You could probably, you could probably get by on what happened here. You know what I mean? Like just basic C language, you could probably guess. Like this might be a little bit confusing, um, but this is obvious, right? I think nobody here would have uh, much questions uh, on what this is, and I think this is pretty obvious. Okay, I did this, even stuff, and then I summed it. Okay, so what the heck is this? Um, right? You see the difference in special character typing, though, right? I don't really see it. That syntax is weird. Yeah, but you could guess what that means. It may be weird, but I have a strong inkling that you can guess what this means. I could guess what that means. Different languages. All right, so that is a comparison of C to C++ to yeah. Rust and to Haskell. All of the links to these solutions and each of the sort of changes. He didn't even explain this. I would love to know what this means right here. This must be the definition, but I don't understand what it means an int to an int on an int. I don't get this. Like to me, it would have been int comma int arrow int, meaning like we take two ints in and we produce one int out. But I don't understand the int to an int to an int. It's curried. Oh. So... The last one is the return. The first one is the curring amount. Or the, the it, it, this is all curring, and this is the return. Last is return, first is curring. Or let me say it this way. Last is return, the rest is curring. You can pass calculate 10 and get a new function back. Oh my goodness, I just had a brain gasm. I'm not going to lie to you. I would hate debugging Haskell. I would hate it. I would hands down hate debugging Haskell. Think about how many things are curried. You don't debug it. You replicate. Oh my goodness. Like, because I, I truly hate debugging higher order functions. It is just one of those things. I, warp death. I love how you say it in such a simple way. Actually, it's just called partial application. You can partially apply my foot in your ass, okay? How does that sound? Does that sound good? Or do you want to do a full application? What are we looking at? Uh, because here's the deal. I hate, I hate debugging higher order functions. It always ends up being like a print crazy town, right? Like you just have to print everything because you have to figure out what in the world your state is. Stop being a hater. I can be a hater all I want. I hate higher order functions, okay? I, I worked on a team with 50 people and all 50 people thought higher order functions were awesome. And you know what? We don't think higher order functions are, are awesome anymore. Took a long time to debug the way the hell out of that thing. Uh, granted, this was also in JavaScript. I'm not sure if JavaScript makes it inherently worse. Perhaps there's tools or language features that make it easier in Haskell to understand, but I don't understand it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I only have JavaScript version of it. 
Love to hate. Yeah. There's uh, Haskell is not the same as Java. Exactly. So there's probably some features, you know, that make it easier. JS makes everything worse. I would agree. JavaScript does make everything worse. If there's a feature in any language, JavaScript somehow managed to always make it worse. Every single time. Every time. I don't even know how it's possible they could do that. It's crazy. Changes will be linked in the description down below in a GitHub repo that I call content. But I also promised that we would do a comparison of the count of assembly instructions generated by each of the C, C++, and Rust uh, pieces of code. So oh, this is that comparison. So you can see on the very far left, we have our C code. And note that the uh, green and blue bars, bars correspond to compiling bars. with the O. Bars. Bar bars. Fatalisk. So this is that comparison. So you can see on the very far left, we have our C code. And note that the uh, green and blue bars, bars correspond to compiling with the O2 and O3 optimizations. Um, the equivalents in Rust are, I think, hyphen opt, hyphen level um, two and three. And uh, I think those are equivalent in these cases or all cases. He's definitely and I can't remember actually what version I compiled with Rust. I think it was 1.63, but um, the details are in the uh, Gobbled example that's linked in the repo that I mentioned that you can find down in the description down below. But if we walk through these, not super in detail, but you can see that C, C++, and the reformatted C++ all have identical assembly, uh, generated assembly, which is great because you would definitely not expect anything uh, formatting to have an impact. And uh, it's great. To see. Is so that means this thing. So I, you know, I never know. It does more instructions mean it runs slower. I don't. I don't know how true or untrue that is, right? Because if you unroll a loop, it can be like longer. And so, it, does it always mean it, right? Like, I can you can you strictly say that is this one slower than that one? Yeah, I mean that's like let's see. You can't know until you run it. Yeah. It's a computer. Okay. Checkmate. Uh, it just, yeah. It's interesting, though. I mean, what's, what's interesting right here is why did these all get so long on the next level of optimization? Like, right, I don't understand why those things got so long. And I also am confused why IOTA is not like an equivalent. Like, how is that not compiled identical? Because in the end, you're just adding a number, right? I, I'm very confused how they didn't come out to be the exact same. SIMD maybe? Okay, okay. SIMD's nuts. You see that C and C++ are identical here um, because you didn't change any of the code. Views IOTA does increase, I think, O2 by an instruction or two and O3 by a few instructions. Uh, but what's very interesting is that views filter um, changes it a lot. So it increases the number of O2 instructions, but decreases the number of O3 instructions. Then uh, uh, std accumulate, ranges accumulate, and the ternary operator change nothing. And C++ format, which behind the scenes, this was sort of left off the slide deck. I Please tell me that, that he, he literally didn't just format his code and it changed it. I was using, I believe, std uh, io.h for each of these, but I wanted to see what the impact of using the C++20 format library and the increase there was like an oh, instruction or two okay. in both the O2 and O3 uh, generated assembly. So read into this what you will. A bit, a bit interesting that the O2 was shorter for up until the IOTA, but then it completely switched. But on average, I guess it's the same across them. I don't really know. I'm not an assembly expert. Uh, but then we get to the very end, Rust, O2 and O3 are the same, and they had 50 instructions uh, for both of those cases. So. Does this make a difference at the end of the day? I will leave that to the viewer to determine and you can debate in the comment section down below. I will conclude the video there. Uh, I hope you enjoy. I'm trying to get some engagement right there, okay? Should we debate this? I think the real thing is that we need to debate this, okay? If we're gonna debate this, we gotta get in there. Um, see, the thing is, that IOTA's greater instruction count is due to the fact that IOTA, being the smallest character, sometimes have the largest impact. 
both metaphorically and literally. Seems about right. I'd say that that was a correct take. I don't know where my comment went. Oh, it went right below here. I feel like that was the right take. It's not about the iota. It's about how you use them. It's a hot take. I know. Enjoyed. Hope you learned something. And there will be a follow-up video being released about two days from now, which is going to be a behind the scenes of how I, I made 80% comment. of this video because the number one question that I get is how do I do my code transitions? And if you are interested in finding out I that, what be sure to subscribe and look for that video in about two days from when this video... I wonder, I, I, I am curious what he uses. What is that? Congratulations, you took perfectly readable code with logical progression, easily debuggable, and turned it into a nice spaghetti. The boomer in me would say, that's what is wrong with the new generation. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty good. PowerPoint? No.